minutes. So we'll uh, go on to the next talk, which I'm presenting, which is on uh, colorectal uh, cancer screening. Uh, and this is just a picture of the uh, new uh, Ohio State University James Cancer Hospital, which uh, we're in the process of putting the, uh, the windows on uh, as we speak. It'll be enclosed by December of this year. Uh, it's a million square foot building, uh, and we have a $1.1 billion mortgage, uh, which I am charged with having to pay. Uh, so uh, we're hoping it'll be full. All right, so good news in colorectal cancer mortality, uh, and that is that we're finally seeing the curves go in the right direction. Uh, and uh, the, the time points on here are the fecal occult blood test trial, which I'll talk to you about briefly. Uh, the time in 1997 when colonoscopy became recommended and uh, later when it became a Medicare benefit. So I would hazard to say that probably everybody in this room has medical insurance. Uh, most of us are over the age of 50, judging from uh, hair color. Uh, and hopefully none of us uh, over the age of 50 have uh, deferred our colorectal cancer screening. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about are guidelines, a little bit about disparities. Uh, there are a number of tests, so it isn't just PSA in my world. Uh, there are a number of uh, possibilities for how to have colorectal cancer screening. I'll give you some suggestions from our uh, greatest thinkers on this and a few take-home points. So uh, one of the issues with colorectal cancer is that we can detect polyps which lead to colorectal cancer uh, using some of our modalities, uh, but only detect cancer using others. And you can see here the tests that uh, detect both polyps, the premalignant condition and cancer, are flexible sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, and CT colonography. A uh, few people are doing double contrast barium enemas anymore these days. Uh, GUIAC testing or fecal occult blood testing or uh, the immuno testing for uh, occult blood uh, have a high sensitivity for cancer but a low detection rate for polyps and I'll show you the data on that. Uh, and then I'll also talk to you about genomics uh, in colorectal cancer screening, the so-called school DNA test, uh, which looks like a very interesting potential technology for the future. So uh, there have been many, uh, many papers and many, many guidelines that have come out uh, in the colorectal world, just as there have been in the prostate cancer world. Uh, and uh, we've, to some degree, uh, questioned the guidelines makers because they come up with disparate uh, recommendations. And so uh, there actually was a group to give us a guideline about guidelines. Uh, uh, the uh, American Cancer Society process for how to uh, develop cancer screening guidelines. Uh, and the U.S. Preventive uh, Services Task Force, which uh, Dr. Godley also noted uh, has ruled on prostate cancer screening, has uh, given us some recommendations on screening for colorectal cancer, and I'm happy to tell you that they still do recommend that up to the age of uh, 75 uh, in individuals who are uh, fit and likely to benefit from early detection. Uh, so uh, between the ages of 50 and 75, if you're African American starting at the age of 45, uh, there is no controversy about colorectal cancer screening. And here is the clinical summary of what they've recommended. And you can see that they've tried to be flexible and said not everybody has to have a colonoscopy. Uh, there are other methods for testing. Uh, the uh, high sensitivity fecal occult blood testing, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, and also now uh, most people are considering CT colonography as a possibility. Uh, for older patients uh, beyond the age of 75, they don't recommend screening, although in my practice, everyone has had colorectal cancer, and I still do screen uh, because they're at higher risk for colorectal cancer as long as they're fit and I ex have a life expectancy projection for them of at least 10 years. Now, there are a number of disparities uh, in uh, uh, the incidence of colorectal cancer. Men are more commonly affected than females, even though men are less commonly screened. Uh, it is a disease of aging. The median age is 72. Uh, and so um, 
when we talk about treating colorectal cancer, we're mostly talking about treating uh, the older patient with colorectal cancer, and uh, that can be fraught with difficulties if they have comorbidities. African Americans not only more commonly get colon cancer, they more commonly die of it, and they more commonly get it at a younger age. We now know that lifestyle affects your uh, risk of colorectal cancer. If you're heavy, if you enjoy uh, uh, a fat uh, laden diet uh, rather than a prudent diet, if you have uh, a genetic predisposition to colorectal cancer, if you're sedentary, uh, and if you have inflammatory bowel disease, all of those things increase your incidence and uh, are, uh, allow you to be categorized as a special risk group with special recommendations. Uh, and um, African Americans and men more commonly die of colorectal cancer than women. So what are some of the tests? Well, I, as you know, the Cochrane Group has done many meta-analyses uh, in a very scientific way, and this is one of them from, published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, looking at fecal occult blood testing. And the Minnesota trial was the very first trial that did this uh, up here. Then the Nottingham, Funen, and Gothenburg trials. Uh, very large numbers of people enrolled in these. Uh, and the bottom line was that by screening people with fecal occult blood testing, you could reduce the risk of uh, dying of colon cancer with a relative risk rate of 0.84. Uh, and this meant a lot of lives saved. So uh, it was interesting to hear in prostate cancer uh, that preventing one death by screening 1,000 people was considered not to be an ideal use of screening. In colon cancer, preventing uh, one death uh, 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 in 1,000 patients was felt to be valuable. Uh, and so uh, we're, we have different viewpoints uh, uh, about that. Now, one of the issues is if you do fecal occult blood testing, uh, it, uh, if anything is positive, it, you need to do colonoscopy. Uh, and of course, diet and uh, other causes of bleeding can cause uh, false positive tests. Uh, the advantages of fecal occult blood testing is you can do it at home without a bowel prep, it doesn't cost much, and it's non-invasive. Uh, the difficulty with it is that it misses uh, a lot of cancers and a lot of polyps. And I'll show you a very interesting study we did when I was at Mayo Clinic uh, about uh, how it missed uh, detecting blood in people with known cancers. Uh, and uh, therefore, it often is falsely reassuring. Uh, here is some data saying that uh, physicians should not rely on a single stool sample. So the old rectal cancer or the old rectal examination with a, a, a smear done at that time is not the way that you do screening. You need to do three consecutive schools and do them uh, every other year in order for this to be effective. Here's a study I mentioned. These are uh, 10 patients with known colorectal cancer. Uh, and you can see that I, everybody who's uh, uh, GUIAC test was below the blue line, would have been, uh, had a negative test at the time that they came in to have a single fecal occult blood test done. So we would have actually uh, missed more cancers than we would have detected if that had been the method of doing it. Now the FIT test is an immune test. It uh, specifically looks at hemoglobin, human hemoglobin, uh, in uh, the stool. So it's a more specific test. Uh, and in comparison with guaiac, it always comes out as being better. Uh, so the bottom line is that it's a higher sensitivity, higher specificity test. Uh, and so nobody should be doing the old guaiac based tests. And here's the specific comparison. So if you look at this for advanced adenoma, neither of these tests are particularly good. The point I made at the beginning that that fecal occult blood testing, whether you do it by FIT or by GUIAC, is not good at polyp detection. Uh, it's better at cancer detection, but here the sensitivities are still terrible, uh, much worse for the uh, GUIAC than for the FIT test. Uh, and advanced neoplasia is advanced uh, cancer or uh, uh, advanced polyps. So it has a superior sensitivity and comparable specificity to guaiac. It uses antibodies. Uh, it's not affected by diet or medications, uh, and it may improve uh, compliance. 
Now, the genomic era has actually come to uh, colon cancer detection. Uh, and uh, stool DNA testing is biologically rational because rather than looking for blood, which is a, uh, an intermittent uh, marker of colon cancer present intermittently in the stool, this one is biologically rational because the, the tumors or polyps are constantly shedding cells. It's non-invasive. It doesn't require a prep. Uh, you don't have to restrict diets or meds. Uh, you can do it uh, in the privacy of your own home and mail the sample uh, to uh, a collection center, and it's widely accessible. It's not affected by the lesion site. It's highly sensitive for both uh, cancer and for the precancers. And this is actually a picture of uh, the mucosa overlying a tumor on this side, and you can see all these cells being shed into the mucosa, as opposed to normal uh, colon where the rate of apoptosis is much lower. And so these cells harbor the same mutations uh, as any cancer cell does, and you can actually use these cells, if you can find them uh, in the stool, and there are ways of finding them, uh, to help diagnose cancer. Now, effective detection when you're using uh, screening tests is a, a function of sensitivity of the test, compliance of the patient, and access. Uh, and uh, what we really want is a, a tool or tools that accurately detects colon cancer and premalignant polyps, is non-invasive, simple, doesn't require a prep or restrictions, is cheap, uh, and is widely distributable. So the sensitivity is the accuracy. Uh, the compliance, of course, uh, is how hard the test is to get and how hard the test is to go through. Uh, and the uh, accessibility is affordability and distributable uh, uh, nature of the test. And this is a study that uh, Dave Alquist uh, and his colleagues published in Gastroenterology just this year, where they looked at the stool DNA test using uh, markers of methylated genes, KRAS and hemoglobin, uh, they uh, looked at 678 patients with colorectal cancer and advanced adenomas present in many of them. And here you can see detection rates uh, using their training set for establishing which genes to use, their testing set and the combined set, which shows that you could detect colorectal cancer 85% of the time and adenomas uh, greater than a centimeter 63% of the time. All right, what's really important is to be able to detect uh, not just stage four cancers, but stage one cancers and premalignant disease. Uh, and the aggregate uh, sensitivity for this was 87%, which is very good uh, uh, sensitivity. And here you can see the larger the adenoma, the more uh, cells are shed, the more likely you are to detect it. Uh, and then it doesn't appear that uh, where in the colon the lesion is matters. Uh, you essentially can detect cancer uh, in the proximal and distal colon with equal ability. Uh, the uh, markers that are used are noted here, uh, and uh, the uh, researchers have been working to optimize uh, the uh, methodology and it continues to get better with time so that now specificity and sensitivity for cancer exceed 90 percent. Uh, and so there's a, an FDA validation uh, underway. Now one of the difficulties for colonoscopists is sessile polyps. So sessile polyps are flat polyps. The way the colonoscopist usually can detect cancer is by seeing an irregularity in the profile of the colon and flat polyps tend to hide. Uh, so we need better tests for detecting sessile polyps, and this test looks like it uh, doesn't discriminate uh, between uh, uh, sessile polyps and, and uh, garden variety polyps. Uh, screening test frequency. Now we know that pap smears uh, uh, are good at detecting cervical cancer, but the, you need to do pap smears annually uh, in the at-risk population in order to optimally uh, detect cervical cancer. The same thing is really true of this methodology in colon cancer, where being able to do it in serial years brings the sensitivity up from 50% with the first screen to 75% with the second screen and into the 90s with the third screen. 
So the advantages of this, no bowel prep, sampling done at home, single stool specimen, non-invasive. Uh, the limitations, it'll still miss some polyps, the smaller polyps, uh, and some cancers. Uh, it, the cost of it uh, is much higher, obviously, than, uh, uh, than fecal occult blood testing. It's a new technology, and so uh, we haven't had it to look at uh, for uh, a long time, and you still have to do colonoscopy. Now, what about flexible sigmoidoscopy? Well, the advantages of flexible sigmoidoscopy is it can be done by a non-gastroenterologist. The disadvantage is that it's often compared to doing a screening mammogram of one breast because you only get a partial look at the colon. Uh, this is about how far up a sigmoidoscope goes. Uh, and uh, 70% of uh, colon cancers are in the distal small bowel in men, but women tend to have more right-sided lesions, and so it's not as good a screening test for women as it is for men. Uh, and so you miss a lot of them. Um, and overall, more than 50% of colon polyps and screen-relevant neoplasia is not detected by this methodology. The other thing that happens is uh, the uh, incidence of colon cancer in the right side of the colon goes up with age. So the older you are, uh, the less likely a sigmoidoscopy is to detect your disease. And here you can see, however, that uh, for colorectal cancer, the hazard ratio uh, still is favorable uh, for uh, the use of this as a screening tool. And here you can see for uh, overall colon cancers and for distal colon cancers, uh, screening is better, but obviously for proximal colon cancers, you don't get any benefit for flexible sigmoidoscopy. It's relatively quick, few complications. It's a minimal bowel prep, uh, minimal discomfort, and it can be done in a family practitioner's office or by a nurse practitioner that's trained in it. It only views about a third of the colon. Uh, you still have to do a bowel prep. Uh, it's not as uh, facile at removing polyps as colonoscopy is, uh, and so you still have to do colonoscopy in the end. What about combining fecal occult blood testing and sigmoidoscopy? Well, the bottom line is that if you do two tests, it's better than doing one test, and you can get uh, a sensitivity for advanced neoplasia of, of about 75%. This is uh, uh, what a colonoscopy looks like. So this is the typical pedunculated polyp. This is what it looks like uh, when the colonoscopists see it. This is the snare that's used to uh, lasso this polyp and uh, retrieve it. Uh, and so uh, you can do both diagnosis and treatment at the same time with this methodology. Uh, it's the best test for polyp detection and cancer prevention. It is, however, uh, costly both in terms of uh, the time spent in the prep, the time spent uh, out of work recovering from the anesthesia, uh, and the cost of the uh, procedure and uh, pathology if you need it. It's not perfect uh, because you still do miss polyps, particularly the flat polyps. It requires a gastroenterologist to do it. Uh, but uh, finally, this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, this publication that we've all been hoping uh, for and waiting for about polypectomy preventing colon cancer deaths came out. And here you can see that uh, in individuals who were randomly assigned to a colonoscopy versus not, that there was a reduction in mortality from colon cancer in long-term follow-up. So the advantage is entire colon. You can biopsy and remove polyps. You can diagnose cancer. Uh, you also can diagnose other diseases in the colon, like carcinoid tumors of the distal ileum. Uh, it, you have to do it if you find an abnormal test of any of the other tests that we do. Uh, and you only have to do it every 10 years if you have a normal evaluation. Uh, it still can miss some polyps, and you, you do have to do the full bowel prep. Uh, there also, here is some data about the miss rate at colonoscopy, and you can see that uh, it depends on the operator. And in very good uh, operators, you can detect up to 98%, uh, but uh, in less good operators, it's 87%. There was an interesting study in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at the withdrawal time of the scope. So the more carefully you look, the more you see. Uh, that's not rocket science, but somebody got a New England publication out of that, uh, uh, which uh, I think is, uh, and, and it changed the practice. Uh, 
So it used to be that nobody ever asked their colonoscopist, what's your withdrawal time? But now that's a quality measure uh, for uh, colonoscopists. All right. There is a small risk of perforation. Uh, it's more common with diagnostic procedures. Obviously, you take a bite out of the colon wall, you're more likely to perforate it than if you just go uh, uh, looking. Uh, but it's still very uncommon. 116,000 procedures, uh, 37 perforations. What about CT colonography, also known as virtual colonoscopy? Well, it provides three-dimensional images of the colon. It, there, you don't have any sedation. You still have to do a prep, and you have to have air insufflation, which is uncomfortable uh, and makes you socially unacceptable for several hours uh, after you have the uh, uh, procedure done. Uh, and it also requires really expert interpretation. You still then have to have a colonoscopy if you have a positive test. But here are some of the amazing images that uh, software refinements have uh, led us to over the years in terms of what you can see on a virtual colonoscopy. It's done with a conventional CT scan, but different uh, software. Uh, and all of these are, uh, are polyps that are readily detectable uh, using this technology. Uh, the sensitivity uh, for detection of adenomas of one centimeter or, or uh, greater is very high uh, in the best studies. Uh, it is very operator dependent. Uh, the other thing that's of interest with this is when you do a CT scan, you often find collateral findings that are of value to managing patients. Uh, and here you can see some ovarian cancers, renal cancers, and others. Uh, it does still require a full bowel prep. Now, I mentioned to you flat polyps, uh, they're harder to see. They're present in about 5% of the screening population, uh, and they remain a problem for us. This is a flat polyp that is less easy to see than that cauliflower uh, type polyp that you saw before. Uh, so screening steps, if you do uh, anything other than colonoscopy, uh, if you have an abnormal finding, it's a two-step process. One last thing I'm going to mention is the pill cam. You see the little pill cam here. Uh, this is now uh, not only for small bowel screening, but is uh, being developed for colon screening. Uh, it uh, is good at detecting uh, small polyps as it tumbles through the GI tract. Uh, and here you can see polyps that were identified uh, by uh, the pill cam. Uh, so my take home messages for you is uh, you shouldn't screen people of average risk before the age of 50, although African Americans have a higher than average risk, so you should consider screening at the age of 45 for individuals of African American ancestry. You do screen after the age of 50. There are a number of different options that you can uh, use, including uh, FlexSig and Fit Test and uh, CT colonography uh, and then the DNA tests. You shouldn't do a rectal exam with a single uh, uh, smear. Uh, if you have any abnormalities with fecal occult blood testing, you do have to go to colonoscopy. Uh, the FIT test is better than GUIAC, so GUIAC uh, should no longer be used. And obviously, colonoscopy is the definitive uh, step. So if you were to use a Netflix-style rating uh, for these, uh, this is what you should remember. The gold standard uh, is colonoscopy. Uh, and uh, the three that are above the line are standardly recommended. I, this is expensive, uh, and you can end up with uh, some uh, false reassurance if you uh, miss studies. Here are co uh, uh, cost effectiveness data, uh, and they all actually fit within the standards of cost effectiveness for cost of life gain. Uh, here you see the cost of colon screening compared to other things that we commonly do for screening, and colon screening is as effective as hypertension screening uh, in uh, saving lives. Uh, last words, it's far more embarrassing to die of a preventable disease than to undergo any of these screening tests. <laughs> and with that, I'll close, uh, and uh, we'll introduce our next speaker.